Welcome back. And now it's on to our last session, the role of analytics in informing social policy, featuring Professor Margaret Brando. The lightning talk will be immediately followed by a 10 minute Q&A. So feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A box directly below the live feed. Without further delay, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Margaret Brando. Good morning, everyone. Can you see my slides? Okay, perfect. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I guess with you. Um, so today I'm going to talk about my work in uh, uh, analytics to inform social policy. Um, my, the, the work of my research group really is about analytics to inform problems in public health. But as time has gone on, I realize more and more that many of the problems, in fact, uh, are broader than just public health. And really, uh, we've started working more in the area of social policy. So I'm going to tell you about four current projects that we are working on uh, in different areas. So in the area of drug policy, what can we do to mitigate the US opioid epidemic? Criminal justice policy, should we continue to lock up low level drug offenders? And of course, the big question of the day, COVID-19 control. What should we do about the spread of COVID-19 in jails and prisons? Can we predict where a COVID outbreak will occur? So for each of these, I'm going to tell you how my doctoral students and I, as our research group, have used analytical models to inform good public policy decisions. So let's start with the project on the US opioid epidemic. Uh, you know, we all think about the uh, COVID-19 epidemic as of course we would, but did you know the US is also suffering from a very severe opioid epidemic? Approximately 150 people per day are dying right now in the United States from opioid overdose. And this is because we've, al we've always had an opioid epidemic at least for the last decade or so, but it's been exacerbated by COVID-19. Uh, in the US, we have a large supply of both legal and illegal opioids. So these take the form of opioid pain pills, heroin, and fentanyl, for example. Uh, along with this large supply of opioid, uh, uh, opioids and um, many people who are addicted, fewer than half of opioid addicts, in fact, receive treatment. So uh, opioid addiction is a significant cause of morbidity, mortality, and social problems in the United States. So my doctoral student, Allison Pitt, pictured here, uh, looked at the following question. What are the health benefits and harms of interventions and portfolios of interventions that aim to curb opioid addiction in the US? And what she did is she developed a dynamic model of the US population, including opioid pill addiction, heroin addiction, prescriptions, et cetera. Here's a schematic of the model. I'm not gonna get into it in great detail, but basically she looked at opioid use status. Does a person not use opioids? Do they use it with a prescription or without a prescription? And then pain status, someone who has no pain, someone who has acute pain, that's right after surgery, say in the first month or after an accident, and then chronic pain, longer term pain. So she made a dynamic model. And we worked with Professor Keith Humphreys from the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford Medical School to identify what are the policies that people are thinking about. And these policies fall into two areas, prevention and treatment. So prevention, clearly we could think about reducing prescribing. The US prescribes more opioids per capita by a long shot than any other country in the world. So maybe we could cut back on prescribing for uh, the acute pain after an injury or long-term chronic pain. We could think about drug rescheduling. That's when um, you, you, can't, you can maybe only get seven days worth of a pill versus uh, getting a month. Prescription monitoring programs. These are state databases that say who prescribes these opioids and who gets them. Drug reformulation to make the pills less addictive. Safe disposal programs where you can uh, take uh, unused medications and, and uh, dispose of them at a pharmacy or other location. There are also treatment. So for example, naloxone, the overdose rescue medication. Needle exchange programs for drug injectors. That's giving people clean needles. Medication assisted treatment, that's for example, methadone or buprenorphine therapy and psychosocial treatment, so-called rehab. So what Allison did is she took these different policies for prevention and treatment, put them into her dynamic model to assess 
what would be the potential impact of any of these interventions alone or in combination? Her study had four main findings. First, in the long term, if we're going to mitigate the US opioid epidemic, opioid prescriptions must be reduced. But of course, you probably knew that before I even started talking about this. This is kind of obvious. But what we found interestingly is that in the short term, reducing opioid prescriptions may lead to increased heroin use. And the reason is when people cannot get diverted opioid pills uh, and they're addicted, they may well turn to heroin, which is pretty easy to get. So, and of course, heroin is far more deadly than the opioid pain pills. So in the short term, bad things can happen. And so the third conclusion is, if you're going to scale back on prescriptions, you also have to scale up treatment programs. And the fourth conclusion is that you need a portfolio of interventions, prevention and treatment, and there's no quick fix. It's gonna be a long road. Uh, we published this work in American Journal of Public Health in 2018. Second project is about diversion programs for drug offenders. Uh, in the United States, many, many, uh, there are many, many drug crimes that are both misdemeanors and felonies. Uh, we lock up many, many people for drug offenses. We lock up so many people that we have special courts called drug courts. So um, the idea behind diversion programs is maybe we should divert low-level drug offenders out of prison or jail and into community-based care and get them the help they need. So for example, cities such as Seattle have implemented diversion programs for drug offenders. So here's a picture. Um, in this case, uh, individuals are using drugs on the street. You could tell, I always joke, you can tell this is Seattle because it's a little bit rainy. Um, but uh, the idea is uh, individuals caught using drugs or, or low-level drug offenses they will be offered the choice of a diversion program, which will hopefully get them into treatment, possibly stable housing, et cetera. So the LEAD program in Seattle, uh, they've evaluated the criminal justice consequences and they found out that there's 39 fewer jail days per individual. Individuals in the program are 58% less likely to be rearrested and criminal justice savings of about $8,000 per person. So what we thought about as well, okay, so there's some public safety and social justice goals. What about public health? So my doctoral student, Cora Bernard, looked, made a model to answer the following questions. For a jail diversion program, how much will the spread of HIV and, and um, hepatitis C virus decrease? So these are uh, uh, diseases spread among uh, drug users, particularly among drug injectors, but also among drug users. Um, how many overdose deaths will we pre prevent if we can get people into the diversion program? How much money will we spend? How many quality adjusted life years will we gain? Quality adjusted life years are a standard metric of health outcomes that's used in health economics. Uh, Cora developed a very beautiful micro simulation model of actually the King County adult population. I put Seattle, but all of King County. Uh, and the basic idea is that uh, there are people who either inject drugs or abuse drugs, but don't inject. When they commit a crime that's identified in the typical cycle, they go to jail, possibly to prison, and then probably right back out to using drugs. That's my dashed arrow here. But with a diversion program, the idea is maybe you could convince people to get into community programs. And these would be needle and syringe programs, substance use disorder treatment, in other words, treat their drug addiction and treatment for HIV or hepatitis C if they're infected. And then the idea is we would hope we could get them to, uh, uh, to treat their drug addiction so that they then not be drug users. So she made a micro simulation model uh, of the Seattle adult population. And what did she find out? Uh, she found out that diversion programs are likely to be cost effective. Uh, they lead to a small increase in healthcare costs, but large criminal justice savings. In addition, they improve length and quality of life for both drug users and the broader population. For drug users, they reduce overdose and incarceration for drug users and uh, people they may uh, have contact with, they reduce the transmission of HIV and hepatitis C. So fundamentally, not only are they good from a social justice uh, and a, a social uh, point of view, they're also good from a health point of view. 
Uh, we published this work uh, just this autumn in uh, a journal called Philosophy Medicine. So now to get to the two projects on COVID. The first project is about preventing COVID-19 in prisons. You may have read about this in the news. Um, the US incarcerates more people per capita than any other country on earth. We have approximately 2.2 million people incarcerated in over 5,000 facilities at any point in time. Um, and as you may have read in the news, lots of outbreaks of COVID in jails and prisons. Uh, in fact, correctional facilities to date account for eight of the 10 largest COVID-19 outbreaks nationally, surpassing nursing homes and food processing plants. So a hotbed of uh, COVID-19 infection. In, in 26 states, the, the rate of COVID infection is higher in correctional populations than in the general population. Uh, and as of just this week, one in five US prisoners has had COVID-19 and 1,700 have died. So uh, we collaborated with colleagues at Yale University School of Medicine. This is work spearheaded by my doctoral student, Giovanni Malloy, to investigate the following question. What is the impact of various mitigation strategies on COVID-19 transmission in a large US urban jail? We worked with Cook County Jail in uh, Chicago, Illinois, uh, which is one of the largest jails in the United States. At any point in time, it has about 6,100 detainees. And uh, in any one year, approximately 100,000 detainees pass through it. So it's a very large urban jail. And they gave us data about strategies they'd been using to try to mitigate COVID-19 and said, can you model the impact of these strategies? So they gave us data for the first 83 days of their COVID-19 outbreak. And what Giovanni did is he fit an epidemic model to their data. It turns out that their uh, jail had four intervention phases in the first over these 83 days. In the first 11 days, they didn't really know what was going on. So they had sort of uh, guidelines that the CDC recommends, you know, wash hands, don't have too many visitors, wear masks. But then when they realized they were starting to get an outbreak, they implemented various additional strategies. So the first is depopulation. This is a jail. So the idea was they would release low level detainees, I mean, low risk detainees. In the second phase, which started on day 18, they increased single selling. It turns out the jail takes up eight city blocks and they have some buildings where they could uh, repurpose and, and create single cells for detainees. And finally, on day 37, they started asymptomatic testing of about 50 detainees per day. Uh, so these are the strategies they implemented. So I mentioned that Giovanni fit an epidemic model to this data. So these are the four phases. Uh, the dots in this picture are the daily incident symptomatic cases that the jail gave us data on. And you can see it's uh, quite variable. So the first thing Giovanni did is he made up a seven day moving, a five day moving average of the data. And then for each of these four phases, he fit an epidemic model to the curve. So this is his fitted epidemic model for each of the four phases of what he predicts the daily incident symptomatic cases would be. And the uh, gray uh, shading is the 95% credible interval. Anyway, so he fitted data, very uh, fit a model very carefully to the data. And what did he find out? He found out that with each of the interventions, the transmission rate was approximately halved. Uh, and despite the impossibility of social distancing in a jail, COVID-19 can be mitigated by depopulation, single selling and, and um, asymptomatic testing. Right now, national guidance still omits these recommendations. So our recommendation from this study is that as we focus on reopening economies, we should really devise strategies to protect vulnerable populations who live and work in correctional facilities. Uh, this work came out just this week in BMJ Open. And in fact, the Chicago Sun Times ran the following article yesterday. Uh, 30 uh, COVID related deaths and 400 hospitalizations are likely averted by measures taken at Cook County Jail, a study finds. 
depopulating the jail and socially distancing detainees were the most effective measures taken to prevent the spread of the virus, a studies by researchers at Yale and Stanford universities found. So very exciting that they're paying attention to our research. And uh, since then, the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections has contacted us and said, you know, we'll give you any data we have. We'd like you to develop prediction models for us to help us make operational changes that will mitigate COVID-19 impact in our prisons. Uh, so for example, they'd like us to figure out which mitigation methods they've used, such as physical barriers and quarantining, et cetera, have had the greatest impact on COVID-19 mitigation. Uh, in addition, maybe figure out which data can, can best predict outbreaks and severity of COVID-19 in their prisons. So data from their correctional facility and maybe data from the community, for example, wastewater data. So this is work we're just going to be starting. Finally, the fourth project is about predicting COVID-19 outbreaks. So COVID-19 has spread rapidly in many places with numerous outbreaks happening all the time. Um, when we think about lockdowns and other social, social distancing restrictions, it's very important to, to target the timing, location, and severity of these restrictions. This is work we're doing in collaboration with Tel Aviv University. That's why I've shown a picture of uh, Jerusalem here. Um, the project we're looking at is how can we use cell phone mobility data to predict COVID-19 outbreaks? This is work spearheaded by my student, Grace Guan. She's using a machine learning model to predict new cases. We have data from March through December, 2020 from Israel. We have cell phone mobility data from 3 million Israelis and we have health and socioeconomic data. Uh, and the basic idea is we wanna predict the category of outbreak so that then you can think about is an outbreak gonna occur? How severe will it be and what should we do? So some findings here. She found that mobility data can improve prediction of COVID-19 outbreaks. And these predictions can be used to target the location, timing, and severity of mobility restrictions. Uh, this is a working paper that we hope to complete and submit for publication very, very soon. So I've told you about four different projects we're working on, on using analytics to inform public health policy and more broadly, social policy. I'd like to tell you my vision for what I'd like to see part of the future of MSNE being. I think we should work to identify important, practical, high impact problems of the type I've shown in these pictures and work to solving them using the tools of management science and engineering. So thank you very much for listening and I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have. In terms of, I guess, Margaret, for, for the, the future of just kind of looking at jails and um, that the data um, as far as um, looking at uh, better practices for um, social distancing and stuff and, and things like that. Can you expand a little bit on that? Yes, I think that, um, well, uh, jails are fundamentally different from prisons because jails uh, are for people who've not yet been convicted of a crime but are being detained or people who've been convicted of a crime but have a short sentence. So they're kind of a different situation, whereas prisons is for people who are convicted of a crime, usually with a sentence of at least one year or more. So more long term. So jails have a lot of churn, prisons do not. Um, what can be done in any particular jail or prison is a function of the, um, the resources that they have. So for example, Cook County Jail had empty buildings they could use. Hmm. Not all prisons or jails do. Uh, and in fact, in California, we had an enormous outbreak at San Quentin Prison. And the reason is prisoners from elsewhere were transferred to San Quentin when early in the epidemic when those, those uh, other prisons wanted to depopulate and, and have less crowding and San Quentin had some space. So uh, that didn't work out too well. So I think we realize now it's probably not a good idea to do too much of that. It's really more to work with what the particular jail or prison has in terms of resources for social distancing. Great, so we have a question from the audience. Um, what is a research question you would like to address, but just don't know how to get relevant data for? In what particular area, I guess I'd say? 
um, if a jails and prisons project, I think um, there's so many things you'd like to know. We'd love it if we had more testing data. We'd love it if we had more data on how people move about in facilities. Um, so I think for many other problems we work on, having data is really the key to be able, able to assess the policies. And in fact, that's why we were able to assess the effectiveness of the, uh, the jail mitigation strategies because they were able to give us all that data. Uh, another question, any data on what happens to prisoners released early as a part of COVID-19 mitigation, impacts on community spread, crime rates? Um, there's anecdotal data, which I've not systematically identified. Um, there, um, when prisoners are released, usually, or detainees are released, they're usually uh, tested for COVID, but COVID tests are not perfect. So um, there's that. So you'd like to only release individuals who are not infected or quarantine them until you're sure they're uninfected. But there has definitely been an uptick in crime, probably uh, partly among detainees. There's also been an uptick in crime in many places in the United States. For example, gun violence has spiked in New York City this year. And they say that's because of COVID. That's not related to people being released from uh, prison though, or jail, that's just related to the epidemic. So what the extent to which detain, uh, released detainees are contributing to the increase in crime, I don't know. Um, the next question is, how is the jail data gathered? Does it rely on jail administrators only or are there other agencies or advocate groups involved? The, jail, the particular jail data was actually just given to us by the jail. But that's a very, very large jail, right? It, it has you know 6,100 detainees at any time. They have a large staff and they were very serious about COVID-19 tr trying to mitigate it. So um, uh, they collected the data. And I am under the impression for the Pennsylvania Department of Prisons, uh, they subcontract their healthcare to some organization, a uh, health system. So I think that's who will be giving us the health data for the prisons in Pennsylvania. Next question is, can spatial and activity data be integrated into the model given that jails restrict movement and cluster people together? That is an excellent, excellent question. And that means you've gotten a very large grant to look at um, COVID in prisons in the US. Um, for that, we are going to develop a micro simulation model of individual movement. So we are going to take several prisons and we're gonna actually look at the buildings and the movement of people between buildings and model that in a micro simulation model. So I think that's very, very important to do as a next step. Um, you may not know much about jails or prisons, but a person is in their cell, but then they come out for meals. They may do work in the prison, in the cafeteria, in a workshop. They may take classes. They go to the exercise yard. So there are lots of, there's lots of movement uh, of detainees among uh, various parts of a prison. And, and it's very important if we truly want to model the spread of COVID to, to model those movements. So that's one of our next projects. So I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, and this question is, is the data model of Israel cell phone mobility used to contact trace after infections or only for modeling infections? Uh, this is only for modeling infections. This is anonymized data, uh, bulk anonymized data. And in fact, if, for example, if there was few less movement than, I don't know, 15 people in one region at any point in time, they, they wouldn't tell us the data. So very, very anonymized. There are many projects where cell phone data, people are trying to use cell phone movement data for contact tracing, but our data is not that. Thank you, Margaret. So this concludes our Q&A for our third session.